well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, and we'll, uh, I'll have the, I have the doors open so folks can join at will for, at this, front, this point forward. So at the beginning, I just wanna say welcome. Thank you to you all for joining with us in a conversation to celebrate this new publication and talk about the ideas. Obviously this is part of our series for Hot Off the Presses. Please encourage colleagues if they are publishing books or have recently published one in the last year, if they want to talk about those books, which I'm sure they do. Um, please encourage them to let us know. We'd be happy to host a conversation. And at the beginning here, as we get going, you'll note that we are recording. We're doing this so we can share this with folks who find this time difficult, given whatever they're facing in their home offices. So we'll be sharing this with the public later on. And as we get started, we also want to acknowledge the land in and around UC Riverside, acknowledge our ongoing debt to Kuiya, the Tongas, the Serranos, the Luiseno peoples, among others who have been tending and caring for the land, water, and air here for uh, countless generations. Um, we have a strong debt of gratitude and acknowledgement that we verbally make at the beginning of our events to recognize that we are indebted to them and we uh, recognize our responsibility to partner with their descendants to continue that care and to and carry that obligation and honor forward into the future with our work so that we can all preserve this beautiful space together. So with that note of gratitude, I will hand it over to Dr. Warnke uh, to officially start the event with some introductions. Um, take it away, Georgia. Great, so thank you all for coming. Um, uh, this is the part of my job I like the best, where I introduce people to other people who know them better than I do. So um, in any case, it's our pleasure to host Edward Chang, who is Professor of Ethnic Studies and Founding Director of the Young Oak Kim Center for Korean American Studies here at UCR. He has published 11 books, seven edited volumes, and numerous, numerous articles. In 2019, he was awarded the Order of Civil Merit by the Republic of Korea, which is the fourth highest medal given by the Korean government. Um, his latest book, one of his latest books is, the, is Korean Americans, A Concise History. And the book he will be talking about today, Pachapa Camp, the first Korea town in the United States. Catherine Gudis is director of the public history program at UCR and uh, a member of the history department. She teaches classes in public history and 20th century US history um, with interests that focus on modern consumer culture and cultural and urban constructions of race, space, and place. She's the author of Byways, Billboards, and Automobiles, and uh, by, sorry, Byways, Billboards, Automobiles, and the American Cultural Landscape an editor of Cultures of Commerce, Representations of Business in America, as well as um, Helter Skelter, LA Art in the 1990s, and A Forest of Signs, Art and the Crisis of Representation. Uh, for 20 years, she has worked as an exhibitions cur curator and consultant with socially engaged art collectives. And she's also worked in historic preservation so she is the right person to be um, in dialogue with Professor Chang here today, and I will hand it over to her. Thank you so much, George, and thank you so much, Ed, for um, asking me to join you in this conversation about your book. So I think um, maybe the first thing is for you to talk about your book. And um, I know that uh, I was really delighted to um, get a copy of it, and really, in part because um, I've known it as a public history site of really significance that you brought to light, and uh, I'm, I'm so happy that there is a book that will allow all of us to be able to engage um, the site and the history in different ways, and it really will contribute immensely to uh, future research as well. But let me hand it over to you to talk, talk about your book a little bit, and then maybe we can be in dialogue about some of the elements that I think um, we're both interested in and others here are too. Thank you, Catherine, and Georgia, and Catherine, and the Center for Ide Ideas and Society for inviting me to participate in conversation about my latest book, uh, Pachapa Camp. Uh, I, I never imagined that I could be able to publish a book on Pachapa Camp in 2016. Uh, back then, I began uh, this research project 
And uh, as some of you may know, Anchanho, Dosan Anchanho Island Mountain, uh, we knew he came to Riverside sometime in early 20th century and worked on the citrus farm somewhere. Uh, that was the only extent that we knew anything about uh, the existence of Pachapa camp back then. And although he's well known, a very well known uh, historical figure in Korea, there have been numerous books and articles, you, know, you, you name it. And yet none of them mention anything about a Riverside, except the fact that he came to Riverside to work in Citrus Farm for a while. That was it, that was the extent of it. And so there is a huge vacuum in his you know, biography. Most of the written materials focuses on from 1911 to 1919. Uh, he came to the United States three different historical uh, time between 1902 to 1907. And he went back to Korea to engage in secret societies uh, independence movement from 1907 to 1911. He re returned back to Riverside in 1911 and continued on until 1919. And in 1919, he went back to China to work in provisional government. And he came back to the United States in 1924 and 1926. And this book, The Pachapa Camp, primarily focuses on the vacuum between 1902 to 1911 and third uh, journey from 1924 to 1926. So I feel uh, I'm making a huge contribution in terms of the vacuum uh, or, or even you know, uncovering the buried past of his legacies. And so back in 20, you know, some people, you know, after reading my book, some people said it's like a destiny that I'm here and the uh, first Koreatown existed here in Riverside. Because back in 2016, when I began this research project, I had very little to go with. And as if it's a, it's a destiny uh, around 2017 and 2018, uh, two graduate students from Korea University majoring in Korean literature came to my center, Young Kim Center, as a graduate interns. Out of blue, I mean, it's a very little connection with liter literature for our center, but they happened to be at, uh, at the center and with their help, I was able to uncover many, many important historical documents, particularly from Korean language newspaper, Shinan Minbo, New Korea. Turns out it was a jackpot. Uh, it was written in old Korean. So I cannot comprehend, you know, even though I can read it, but I'm not able to comprehend the meaning of it. Fortunately, these two graduate students from Korea University major in Korean literature, it's their major to translate old Korean to modern Korean. And they were able to provide and translate uh, old Korean texts into modern Korean texts. And I was able to piece it all together. It's like a trying to find needle in haystack in the beginning, there were none. And as I began to piece it all together, I was able to uh, put it all together puzzle. And finally, I was able, I was convinced that this was the first Korean settlement. And I call it, I kind of exaggerate being the Korea town, but I, I wanted to emphasize that first organized Korean settlement in the United States, including in Hawaii. And therefore I, I was able to uh, make a, a claim. And one of the most historical important of the settlement is that this was the only Korean settlement that consists of family, women and children, and as well as men live together in one place. As some of you may know, uh, early uh, Asian American community was predominantly bachelor societies because of racist immigration law that restricted migration of women. And the Chinatown was mostly bachelor society. 
Filipino Manila town or bachelor societies and Korean community was very similar. But Pachapa camp, one of the very important distinct characteristics of it is the family-based community and it was the mecca of independence, early independence movement for Dosan An Chang Ho and his, his followers. So I just wanted to share, you know, you know, my thought on this and then maybe we can engage in conversation from now on. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, that's really interesting because what you're sort of outlining is, um, you know, enhances what my understanding is um, also of your own process, because I know that um, for years, many of us in who, who study Riverside and the natural and built environment here have talked about Pachapa and in terms of the Korean settlement that's marked on the Sanborn map that um, dates from 1908, that's also the start of your, your book. Um, and I'm actually gonna just, uh, I, I'm sorry for my changing background, but I, I wanted to just offer opportunities to show a couple of things that um, you know, are some of the illustrations in a way uh, of, of the process of your book where you know, many of us, I was working with the city of Riverside in the, pl in the planning community development office on a preservation study of the east side of Riverside um, and you know, uh, fairly new to the histories of the area and was really surprised to see this Korean settlement marked on this map that you see behind me. And you could see that there's the term shanties that run across it, but this is a fire insurance map. Um, and it indicated dwellings in center cities across the United States um, in order for you know, cities to value it and for insurance purposes. And so you can see that there are dwellings that are marked here. Well, what you don't see in this image is that immediately across the street is a parallel designation that indicates Japanese shanties. Um, and Jap Jap Japanese settlement, right? And so these are across the street from one another. And so for many years, people in the city planning office would reference this. Um, and then, you know, I think Professor Wong is um, here in the, in the Zoom room and she had also called attention to uh, Mary Pack's autobiography in talking about the living in this settlement and sort of, you know, what that was like, which you also talked about. And so, so for years, there was this basic knowledge of place, but not the people affiliated with the place. And then, Ed, you talk in your book about how there were these stories of people, but then not the place that they were uh, affiliated with. And so when you say this destiny, it really resonates for me because it does feel like you put these pieces together in a really uh, important way where we can connect people in place and make them have these reciprocal relationships that in looking at, you know, Carol, uh, Carol Park's face here on the screen also make me realize that, you know, this, you know, the next generation of scholars are going to be able to do so much with with what you've been able to present in, in your books. And I know you've done it with the help of other people from the Young Oak Kim Center. But when you um, start your book, you start it with the designation of the site as a, a point of cultural interest. And for those of uh, the people on the line uh, here on the Zoom who might not know, it, it wasn't just that Ed and his team actually uh, put this on the map for Riverside through the process of the Cultural Heritage Board having hearings and then the city council having hearings and then it being designated and then it uh, also including a plaque which he and others erected with the help of Southern California Gas which is what's cited at this location now since no building stand but but rather he actually you know managed to change the ordinance itself in order to do that um, and so th that's a that's a really incredible thing and so that's partly why I was so happy to see that you um, you did publish the book on Pachapa Camp because those of us who know the sort of site itself and the plaque itself now have the means to be able to understand the much deeper and richer history that in fact now in what you just said I realize you uncovered even asked after um, this point of cultural interest was demarcated and so can you talk a little bit about this connection of people and place that you um, indicate in your book in other words what was this place like if you were going to sort of try and give us a little bit of a sensibility of what this first Koreatown, and again, I, I, I acknowledge your, you know, your statement about what it means to call something a Koreatown in a contemporary perspective, right? It's not like LA's Koreatown right now, although you were also instrumental in sort of pacing out the history of LA's Koreatown, right? What, what might it have been like for these, what I'll call early settlers? 
Yeah, it's, like you said, it was a shanty town. Uh, it's pretty much wooden structure, no run, running water, uh, no electricity, but it was a kind of a temporary shelter that was established in 1880s by mostly Chinese uh, railroad workers. And they left after the completion of the railroad, they left. And then it was early 1903 or 1904, Korean immigrants began to settle in and occupy that particular part of the town. And so, but it was more than a temporary settlement. It was a permanent settlement by Korean immigrants. Uh, as a uh, majority of Koreans who came initially to San Francisco, unable to uh, secure a stable job and income, they saw opportunity to work in the Riverside. As you know, Riverside was one of the richest cities in the United States at the time. There are plenty of employment opportunities. And An Chang-ho established a Korean Labor Bureau sometime in late 1904 or early 1905 and, and able to bring new newcomers to Riverside and they were able to find jobs and kind of com com comprised community uh, consisting of women and children. In 1905, they established a uh, meaning cooperative association. And it was established with the principle of separation of powers, a democratic institution, and they were working for toward independence of Korea. And they established a headquarters in San Francisco, but majority of the members were residing and working in Pachapa camp. So that was the beginning. And I also uncovered the very important historical fact that the democratic republicanism of South Korea today originated here in this site. That's my argument. And I was able to connect what happened in 1911 in third uh, you know, North American Korean National Association convention held in Riverside, the Pachapa camp. And it goes toward a Korean provisional government of 1919, which all of a sudden declared you know, democratic republicanism. Remember, Korea was ruled by King until 1910. And uh, Korea was colonized by Japan in 1910. And all of a sudden, nine years later, they declared democratic republicanism. And historians agree that there was no debate, no opposition of establishing democratic republicanism. How is that possible? And I argue that you, because Koreans in the United States, particularly here in Riverside, was already practicing democratic republican form of government here in Riverside. And they saw how it worked, how it, and, and they were able to translate into uh, current form of government. So, but it, anyway, but it was a complete community. Not only it had a uh, church, birthday parties, uh, wedding ceremonies, and uh, you know, independence movement, and all kinds of uh, community activities all evolved around a Pachapa camp. They were, they were working as a farm workers or domestic workers, and yet uh, they, the community thrived. Uh, uh, although you know many of them were poor, very poor. Thank you. Um, that's it's really illuminating also to hear about the ways in which the Labor Bureau worked. Um, you know, in in how, how did that function, and was it um, long lasting, or what was the period in which the settlement uh, you know was established and grew? Yeah, settlement I believe it began uh, late 1904, and the uh, Pachapa camp itself existed until 1918. I, I found on. Uh, news report of Korea, uh, Shinaminbo, the Pachapa camp finally relocated to nearby Vine Street, which is uh, the, uh, the train station exists right now today. Uh, so it, it was a, from 1904 to 1918, and as you know, in 1913, uh, you know, deep freeze uh, devastated the citrus farm industry in Riverside, and many of them began to relocate 
to Central California or Northern California, such as Ridley and Danuba or Willows. And, uh, and so the Pachapa camp began to dwindle down, but it continued to maintain its existence until 1918 and unable to maintain it because of membership dwindled down to like five, six families. So they decided to shut it down and relocate to nearby uh, place in Vine Street. You know, in terms of the the the, the growth of um, a, a nationalist movement, in what ways did Riverside serve as a hub, and in what ways was it a locale that then stretched out um, elsewhere? I'm, I'm kind of interested in that as well as the migratory patterns that um, that you 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 note. Yeah, I'm, Riverside was the kind of a base camp for uh, Korean immigrants working around uh, this town, town like uh, Claremont, uh, Redlands, and uh, Hemet and other nearby places. So Riverside Pachapa camp, the Korean immigrants would come to Riverside to settle, but you, can, you are not going to be able to find work 365 days a year. So whenever there is a job available nearby, they would go there to work and then return back to Riverside. So, you know, the, it was a kind of a base camp uh, and, and and the largest, and uh, Shinan Minbo, as well as the several other writers uh, confirmed that the Pachapa camp was the first and largest Korean settlement in the United States at the time. So, you know, in mainland, there were less than, uh, 800 people, Korean immigrants at the time. And I was able to kind of uh, trace that uh, during the harvest, you know, picking season from December to February, uh, they would look for temporary workers as many as 100 or more. And that there were uh, Korean uh, settlers or uh, about 200 of them residing, working, living in Pachapa camp. So, uh, you know, peak, there would be about more than 300 Korean immigrants working and living, working in this Pachapa camp, which is, you know, a very significant factor. And it was the base of Korean independence movement uh, because of the leadership of An Chang Ho, Dosan An Chang Ho. And when, when he returned back to uh, Riverside in 1911, uh, third Korean National Association of North America Convention was held in Riverside. And one of the puzzling fact is that although all the you know, written materials about An Chang Ho, no one, no one has mentioned anything about this convention, which is very puzzling to me because it was this convention that established uh, principles of democracy based on separation of powers, executive power, executive branch, and judicial and legislative branch was all established at this convention in 1911, which become basis for forming the Democratic Republican government. And uh, so with the return of An Chang Ho, you know, Riverside became the you know, thriving place for the early Korean independence movement because he was a leader. He, the leader, uh, the vacuum of leadership uh, kind of a floundered the Korean nationalist movement with his return to Riverside. Now he, he was able to lead again. Yeah, that is really interesting in terms of like it taking place in Riverside and, and not being discussed. And I, I, I do think that there's, um, you know, this relationship of um, the more established cities to what, you know, might have been called, uh, you know, or some people today call, you know, a hinterland, right? And that that relationship, um, you know, is hard to overcome in some ways, but who would have been at that 1911 convention where so much was established? Would it have been people from all over the state? Um, well, the, know, there were uh, branches. Korean National Association has, uh, different chapters. So Riverside had a chapter and Bay headquarters were in San Francisco and there were different locales. So there were about eight or nine, uh, 10 different chapters at, in California. Mm -hmm. And it was the, remarkably, it was the first and last time all chapter presidents attended the meeting. <laughs> That's another very remarkable 
fact because because they all came to Riverside because they wanted to see An Chang Ho. Yeah. An Chang Ho just returned from Korea. Now he's our leader, and we, they all wanted to come and show support. And the the convention held for ten days, and uh, it began uh, November twenty third around two o'clock in the afternoon, two or three o'clock in the afternoon, and ended December fourth. Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so they say it was all night debate. They were debating all night long, you know, strategy, how to accomplish, how to achieve independence of Korea. So, you know, it was their determination and dedication uh, that really set the foundation for early Korean independence movement. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, historians mainly focused on San Francisco and LA, and they just simply ignored Riverside. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why all the written documentation uh, begins with uh, after uh, kind of a 1912. Mm -hmm. And the 1911 is just buried. And yeah. I, I'm just uh, uncovering the historical importance of the, uh, the particular convention in 1911. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're you've really given. I'm 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 going to switch to this picture here because I think it relates to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I oftentimes we encounter these photos. Um, this is from the uh, Museum of Riverside, um, and you know, there's information that it's you know the the Korean community and and also that An Chang Ho is in the center of the image, um, but really little else. Could you tell us a little bit about this this photo? Yeah, and this and I have to say, you've uncovered a treasure trove of other uh, photos in in your research and your interviews since the '90s. Um, yeah. So I'd love to hear more about those other treasure troves that you've uncovered in the process. Yeah, yeah this, this is the exact photo that I just mentioned. Uh, third uh, Korean, uh, Korean National Association of North America Convention that held in Riverside, 1911. And afterward, uh, they took a photo, all the delegates and the chapter presidents attending and uh, with uh, the family members. That's the particular building and that's the community center. It also functioned as a they held uh, Sunday services, uh, Korean mission services in this building. And all the you know, wedding, birthday party, all the community activities evolved around this particular building. This is the only uh, second story building in Pachapa camp. Everything else is first one story building, but this is the community building. And uh, so it was burned down in 1913. I, I, I saw, I. So the Korean, uh, you know, Korean mission was a part of the Calvary uh, Presbyterian Church of Riverside, and they provided funding to rebuild. I don't know whether they re rebuilt exactly the way it is, but uh, they, they make a note that it was burned down because of the fire in 1913. So this particular building was the base of community activities, all the community activities in the, in the lectures, you know, special meetings, all held in this particular uh, building. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, very in passing, Hemet. Um, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of anti-Asian, um, um, you know, uh, um, experiences that that people might have, um, you know, held? I think it resonates for today, um, also. Yeah, Hemet. A valley incident, and that's how it's known as, occurred in uh, June 1913. Uh, at the time, uh, several newspaper reporting uh, misidentified that 11 workers came from LA, Redland, Riverside, all, all over the place. But I was able to confirm that they came from Riverside, the Chapa camp in Korean newspaper. And they, they were hired by the local farmer in Hemet and they went to Hemet from Riverside uh, by train. And when they landed in Hemet, there were more than 200 uh, white workers awaiting and told them to go back to where you came from, just like you know, anti-Asian uh, hatred that we are witnessing today. The you know, white workers didn't want any Asians uh, to come into their town and work. And this particular incident became international conflict. When Japan found out about this, Japanese government, Japanese government decided to claim 
the Koreans in the United States are Japanese subjects. Therefore, we have a right to protect. So the Japanese council and Japanese embassy in Washington DC intervened on behalf of Korean workers and they officially protested to US government. So it became international conflict. Uh, so Secretary of the State, William Jennings Bryan uh, ordered uh, investigation of it. And, and, and when the investigation was taking place, the Korean National Association of North America, President David Lee, sent a telegram to Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan uh, stating that we are not Japanese subjects. We are Korean. Please recognize as a Korean and not as a Japanese subjects. Uh, receiving this telegram, the William Jennings Bryan, uh, Jennings Bryan decided to resolve this conflict without any difficulty by declaring the Koreans in the United States are not Japanese subjects. Um, uh, they are going to be represented by the Korean National Association. Uh, Japanese government has no uh, right to intervene on behalf of uh, Korean workers in the United States. So although Korea was a colony of Japan, have no sovereignty of its own right, the, at least they were able to gain semi-government, uh, semi-quasi-independent uh, status here in the United States. Therefore, they were able to use that as a legal ground to continue to engage in independence movement in the United States, which is of direct contrast to Koreans residing in Manchuria or Siberia. They were not able to do so because they were uh, considered as Japanese subjects. That, that's a, it's a really fascinating way in which you're bringing the, um, not only the nationalist movement and the politics around it, but also national politics within the United States back home to Riverside. I, I think that's a, it's a really interesting way in which you're expanding um, the, you know, the story of this particular location and settlement and the people who participated. You also have a really interesting set of chapters, one of which is focused on women and another that's around family genealogies that, that you've sort of uncovered in the process of doing this work. And I was especially interested by Ellen Sun. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name properly. Um, who's uh, who? Who had several? Who had a, a series of articles in Korea Times? But that you also, I think you also interviewed her yes, way yes. earlier than your research for this particular project. Yes. Can you tell tell people who who haven't read the book yet a little bit about some of those findings? Yeah, I mean Ellen. Uh, you know, uh, when I uh, began my career here, here Riverside in 1992. She called me and she said she wanted to uh, have a conversation with me. And she talked about how she was born in Riverside and grew up. And you know, I didn't know anything about Riverside at the time. I had no interest whatsoever. And I thought maybe you know, I should record this conversation. Good thing I did. <laughs> so I had a you know, conversation of recording. Uh, I, I interviewed her twice. And what she told me makes a lot of sense. I was able to put it together, and and at at, at uh, all the uh, at the same time the the what's the, what's the name of the book that you just mentioned that uh, by what's her name Mary Peck Lee Mary Peck Lee oh yeah book. yeah sorry yeah Mary <laughs> and, and so. It made a lot of sense to me, and so she because she left so many writings. Her family is writers. Her father left like six, seven novels in Korean, and her brother, I mean the nephew, uh, nephew uh, also are very well known writers and very famous people. So they they are kind of a you know, family who wrote a lot of stuff. And many of them are talking about their uh, stories growing up in Riverside. So I was able to get a lot of lot out of it from their family stories as well. But uh, the river, Riverside uh, is very important because you know, the women in the United States uh, were able to gain voting rights in 1920. Remember, right? But Korean National Association An Chang Ho decided 
to grant full membership to women in 1918. Can you believe that? And he said, women have a, every full rights as a member and rights and responsibility as a man, like man. So he, he believed in equality of women. And so that's another very revolutionary idea of this man. Although you know, An Chang Ho is pretty much uh, viewed as a very conservative leader in Korea, but uh, to me, he's a revolutionary. His ideal of a democracy, a Christianity, as well as uh, equal rights. I mean, that, that was a revolutionary idea in 1918, right? The suffrage movement was still going on here in the United States. So after that, uh, women became full member of the Korean National Association and they took leadership. I, I, I was you know, remarkably surprised that some of the, the meetings were led by women and the lecture sermons were conducted by the women uh, shortly after 1918. So, and yet uh, they were the backbone of the community. They were responsible for Know, maintaining family, rearing children and household. So they did all the, you know, triple roles of the superwoman, right? And so the women's, uh, that's again, one of the very unique uh, characteristics of uh, Pachapa Kim. Shall we open it up? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. So we open it up to questions from all of you. I think um, if you just, uh, let's see, raise your hand or put it in the chat then, but I think you can ask uh, Professor Chang directly. So who has the first question? Deborah. <laughs> Unless somebody else has something, I just, Edward, I just want to congratulate you on all of this amazing research you've done to bring Pacharpa Camp, you know, sort of, you know, back into local memory. I mean, just thank you is the main thing I want to say. But I wonder if you and um, Dr. Carol Park could talk a bit about um, the extensive work you did to ensure that there's a, a plaque, a historical marker at the actual site. I mean, that that was that took a lot of effort on your parts and. I mean, I, I'd also love to hear you talk about why commemorate a site that one could say is no longer there, <laughs> you know? Talk to us a little bit about that and, and tell us what it took to get that plaque there. Yeah, it was kind of a more than a two years efforts. Uh, it's not just uh, me or Carol, it's a total Korean American community supported it. You know, everyone except one person, but I, I won't really get into that. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the historical legacy uh, that once that I was able to put it all together, I, the historical significance of it, uh, we already had a statue of him in downtown anyway, right? Downtown Riverside, it was statue was established in 2001. So this year commemorates the 20th anniversary of erecting Dosan An Chang was a statue in downtown. Uh, so it has a lot more historical meaning by designating a Chapa Camp site as uh, number one, number one, as uh, Kathy uh, said, uh, they were able, uh, we were able to kind of revise the whole city ordinance and uh, the, in order to designate it as a, a point of a cultural interest, they created that particular category because they were no longer any building left, right? It was a historical site. So, you know, together the statue and the, the designation, now we, we, we are able to tell full stories and uh, it's the historical meaning to, you know, future generation or anybody who is interested in early Korean American independence uh, movement sites. So we are in the process of, uh, hopefully getting some kind of a small museum, uh, tying everything all together. And so, in fact, tomorrow I'm going, we are going to have a meeting, Zoom meeting with mayor of Riverside, the possibly getting some you know, sites 
uh, nearby sites where we can all put it all together. But hopefully, you know, something will happen. And we all, yeah. And what was your last question? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, one could argue there's there's nothing there anymore. I mean, I think the place is really important, but I'd love to hear you say a little bit about why mark a place where nothing is left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although unfortunately <laughs> there's nothing left and it's now is a private property owned by the Southern California Gas Company. I think the, the fact that it was one of the first organized settlement uh, and it has a very important historical meaning of it and where everything originated. And it also, uh, not only Dosan Anchang was a legacy, uh, his uh, uh, early independence movement, and I call it Mecca of early Korean independence movement established by the Anchang and his followers. Uh, so we, we need to recognize that historical importance of the particular site and how it evolved from there, right? And uh, it branched out to nearby Claremont, to Rutland, and later on to to uh, uh, Danuba, Ridley, and, and Willows. In 1920, Korean immigrants also established uh, pilot training uh, facilities in Willows. And some of the members resided in Riverside. So there's all kinds of uh, links and historical uh, symbol symbolism that we need to connect uh, and kind of make uh, uh, the early Korean immigrant community much fuller and uh, gives a more uh, meaning to that. Other questions? Sanghee has um, a question in the chat. There are two questions. One is, I don't know if you would like to narrate it yourself. <laughs> Professor Lee. Uh, hi, I had to unmute myself. Hi. Um, sure. I, I really, um, I wanted to thank Ed and also the special congratulations for writing this this uh, book, which means a lot to me uh, on a personal level, but I think it is also, of course, brings out the importance of the, the deep historical ties between Korean American societies and Riverside, California, in particularly. But so I've heard of several, uh, some of these stories before and maybe more than twice, but they never, they, every time I hear it, it's just amazing and inspiring to me. I do have a couple of questions. Um, one is, also, every time I hear the story, I, you know, I'm an, I'm in anthropology department or at our anthropology department that which we, where we do have an archaeologist. Is there no chance to do a historical archaeology project on this site? I understand it is a private property owned by uh, now you know, a gas uh, company, but and the owner is not maybe not too keen on the idea. But I wonder if there are any changes or possibilities, and. And because I think it will be a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for, for a couple of one or two theses coming out of this um, subject. And number two, are you still working on this project? And if you do, where do you see the project going from here? Yeah, thank you, Sangi. Uh, hope you're safe in Korea. <laughs> Korea is safe <laughs> in the United States. Anyway. I, 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 I am safe. Yeah, uh, number one question, uh, as of now, is almost impossible uh, unless, you know, property owner uh, agrees to it. I probably the only way we can do it is buying the property from Southern California Gas Company and make it, uh, you know, feasible. I think that's the only way uh, things can be done. In terms of your second question, uh, I, my research on the Pachapa itself is almost done. Uh, so I'm not planning to, you know, further, but instead I'm more, more focusing on uh, enhancing visibility. Uh, uh, like uh, we are going to have a exhibit at the Culver Center beginning August 14th until February 2022. So there will be an exhibit uh, on Pachapa camp and, and as well as uh, you know, the, we are going to have a 
a seminar in November 7 at the Culver, Culver Center. Again, uh, after reading my book uh, written in Korean, one uh, Korean historian wrote another article, uh, uh, many detailing the, the Pachapa camp. It's a, my, my article is more of a structural uh, outlier, but his article is more detailed. So th therefore it confirmed uh, what I, I have done. So, you know, we are going to invite him to have a conversation about the Pachapa camp. Uh, so, and all, at the same time, I think a development office is interested in uh, uh, applying for the grant to expand this uh, because of a given historical importance. So I'm going to have a meeting, Zoom meeting next week to uh, further discuss. So I think the possibility of enhancing the visibility and as well as, uh, you know, next researcher uh, focusing on different aspects of this historical site is endless. I think there's a lot of possibilities out there. That's, that's great, thank you, Ed. I do have one um, follow-up question, sort of. Uh, I, um, of course, I, I this is not, this is just hearsay, something that I kind of picked up around, um, walking around, but I've um, note, I've heard that Dosan An Chang Ho's contribution or, or position in Korea history has been sort of purposefully minimized because he was a political competitor of the first uh, president slash dictator, um, Syngman Rhee, um, and that there are some movements to, to bring forth and reevaluate the uh, wrongfully, mistakenly, or perhaps biasedly uh, minimized role that he played in, in, in Korean history. And I think Pachapa camp, which should gain a lot more attention than it is, I wonder if that has anything to do with that kind of uh, move, not movement, but tendency not to um, appreciate Dosan's contribution in Korea history. Yeah, there are many different factors. I mean, that certainly is one factor. An chang -ho and Sung man mm -hmm. were the rival. And, uh, and when Sung man Rhee became first president of the Republic of Korea, he didn't allow any uh, uh, members of Korean National Association to come back to Korea at all. And so he suppressed uh, An chang -ho's legacy, definitely. At the same time, uh, during the dictatorship uh, led by Park chung hee and military uh, dictators uh, during the 70s and 80s, uh, because the, the An chang -ho's organization, including Young Korean Academy and other organizations were suppressed as a revolutionary organization, anti, and because they were dem democratic, uh, they're pursuing democracy. Uh, because of that, uh, they purposely uh, kind of a withdrew uh, from public, and they made An Chang Ho a very conservative figure in order to survive the oppression, suppression by the military dictators in Korea. And there are many other reasons why the An Chang Ho is not uh, highly uh, valued uh, because of he's kind of a moderate. He he's he occupy middle ground in terms of ideology. Whereas in Korea, there is a very, very uh, strong competition between very progressive and very ultra conservative, even today. So it, unless you take side one way or another, just like what, what is going on here in the United States today, you are nobody, no one pay any attention at all. So in, term, in terms of uh, historical recognition of An Chang Ho, historians in particular, are not even paying any attention to An chang at all. And like, but like I said before, I believe he's a revolutionary figure. And I believe he, he was tr you know, really you know, 100 years ahead of that time. And uh, he believed in democracy. He believed in equality of uh, you know, gender. And he believed in you know, all kinds of uh, democratic ideal and Christianity. So he was way ahead of his time. And not only that, he, he was a leader who practiced his ideal. He worked side by side with his fellow Korean workers here in Riverside. We have a photograph of it. 
he was not intellectual leader. You know, he, 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 he practiced his ideal. So he, that's the reason why people followed him. Whereas uh, Sung Man Rhee was intellectual leader. He didn't do anything <laughs> except write and speech, right? So I think you know, his legacy should be reevaluated and definitely. Thank you. So is that your next project to rehabilitate his legacy? Yeah, I, I've written a, a new article about a democratic republicanism of South Korea. And so uh, it's going to take a, a lot to convince a lot of people because, you know, I'm basically rewriting history of Korea, right? Modern history of Korea. So, and, and the historians uh, don't like that <laughs> because, you know, whatever they've written is being challenged by this. I'm not even a historian. I'm not even trained in as a history. So, but uh, I'm very convinced. I, I, I was able to find all the you know, relevant documents and particularly 1911 convention in Riverside, they had a 21 articles passed. The 21 articles passed resolution is almost identical to the, what they uh, uh, announced in 1917 a declaration and later on adopted by the Korean provisional government of Shanghai. So I'm very convinced. Well, I'm just going to put in a plug for you. It sounds like it should be you to write up just, you know, the basic um, history of the 1911 convention on Riverside. I, you said that nobody has written about it, didn't you? Yeah, you see, it's in the book. Uh, I detail. You it's in your book. book, which I haven't yeah. seen, by the way. Okay, I'm glad you did in that case. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in addition to the book, and I, I think it's all of your work at the Young Oak Kim Center in, in terms of both documenting what you're talking about, but also building additional collections that enable so much more work to be done. And, you know, I, I say that in part as a happy recipient of some of it through, you know, community projects that I've been working on with California State Parks, where we get to tell a much bigger story at other locations, uh, you know, due to what you've been able to document and also what you're collecting. And I'm saying that in part because of the Catherine Violet Kim collection, which I had not realized that she was the last, um, the, the last uh, connection to Pachapa Camp upon her passing in 2018. Can you just say a few words about her or, or, or your yeah. findings with that collection? Yeah, we are very fortunate to uh, interview her right before he, she passed away. Uh, by then she was, her memory faded away, but she donated uh, family uh, photographs uh, and written materials, a lot of stuff to Young Kim Center. And we since then turned it over to the Rivera Library. And so they are going through the you know, archival process right now. But, you know, we were able to find many photographs of the Chapa camp itself, as well as our family story is very important connection to the Chapa camp because her father was the eldest son of uh, the person who pretty much maintained Pachapa camp in the absence of An chang -ho. Remember, An chang -ho was always going around different parts of the uh, country, lecturing and, and trying to fundraising. So in the absence of An chang -ho, uh, Catherine, uh, uh, Violet Ka Catherine's father uh, uh, and his father maintained uh, the kind of order of the Pachapa camp. So she left a lot of important historical documents and the photographs. Therefore, uh, that needs to be researched uh, and make a, a, another important discovery. I'm sure there is, is treasure. Yeah, it's a treasure and we, we need to make the connection again, but I'm not sure if I, uh, hopefully the next scholar can do that. I wonder if we could have some kind of virtual reconstruction of the camp 
Oh, the, I, we are going to do that. We, you know, oh, yeah. in, in conjunction with the Culver Center exhibit, we are also going to have a virtual exhibit as well in simultaneously. So, you know, it, it, it will be done uh, in conjunction with that. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about that? That sounds amazing. <laughs> well, that is being done by the uh, you know, Culver Center uh, and, and we, we are providing materials but they are the one who in charge of exhibit itself. So I, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm sure they have experts who, who can uh, turn into virtual exhibit. Carol, can you say more about it or? You need to unmute. Sorry, yes, I'm simultaneously in a class. So my apologies. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, to talk about the the exhibit, exhibit. right? Yeah. yeah, it's gonna have um, the found objects. So part of Catherine Violet Kim's um, estate, which was generously donated um, through Mako Inaba, who was her executor at the time. So it's this great friendship between these two people. Um, it's gonna include like these quilts that were there that were sewn by them in the early 1900s, um, found objects like that. The exhibit itself digitally will include um, like the pictures and things that have not been seen before of the family members of places that we believe were Pachapa camp because you can see the canal, um, other things. Uh, it's gonna have, I believe Professor Cheng, the reconstruction, right, in 3D of the actual Pachapa camp site itself on a smaller scale. Um, and then guided, I think, pieces where you can read or listen to, I'm not sure yet how it's gonna be Dr. Cheng, but I think you know best. Um, but there'll be pieces of information that go with each of those photographs telling the history. There's the first passport of the first Koreans that came here. So it's got the um, stamp of the Korean foreign ministry, things that, that are just wonderful to see these objects that tell the story of the Korean community that was here. That's going to be part of this exhibit that just has not been seen before because the, the Kim family, they were pack rats. Like <laughs> when we went and got their, the, the, uh, the boxes full of all this wonderful stuff. They had stuff in there from like 1905. <laughs> it was like, wow. So I think the exhibit itself is going to be extraordinary because you'll be able to see all these pieces that have just never been seen before. So hopefully that. Yeah. 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 Kim family is the original settlers of the Chapa camp and they never left Riverside. They're the only one who never left Riverside. So it's a very important historical a legacy and connection to the Pachapa camp. Well, I hope these stories um, become a foundation to a new Korean drama. That's how we will raise the visibility of this <laughs> wonderful story. Yeah, we need to find a drama writer and that's how it goes in Korea. <laughs> we need to find a writer who is willing to write a script. Famous one. <laughs> You're turning into TV drama. Being slightly addicted to um, Korean dramas that I've been watching during uh, COVID lockdowns. I, I would say that as I was reading this, I really was. <laughs> I really was, especially when I was reading about some of the women's sections and the family. I've been really taken with um, those stories. So really appreciate that you've brought these to light. Um, it, it's And I'm, I'll, I'll wait also for the drama. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, this is really, I'm eager to read the book now and really eager to see the exhibit. Um, this is just astounding and astoundingly important work. And we thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you soon. <laughs>